Um, I thought I was just hearing things. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, we have WEP using this uh, long-term uh, key K. Okay, so we've got this key K, uh, and we're trying to encrypt packets. Okay, so every packet's going to be encrypted, you know, independent of the other packets. You know, someone might get lost or whatever, so we don't want to have to rely on having all the packets there. Okay, so we encrypt each packet independently. Okay, now we've got this key K. We're using a stream cipher. If we use that key K to encrypt all the packets, that would be very bad, okay? Why would that be very bad? It would be, you know, like a one-time pad that you're using over and over and over because you encrypt the packet, you start over with the next packet, you know, initialize the cipher, encrypt that packet, initialize, encrypt that. You'd use that key over and over and over again. Okay, so you're opening the door to attacks based on the reuse of the key stream. So okay, the people who designed Web realized that. So they said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna use an initialization vector each time we encrypt. So the initialization vectors are not secret, okay, just like in other modes of uh, encryption, and they're sent as part of the packet. Okay, so that's in the packet. Everybody gets to see what the ID is. Okay, and the way they use that, because it's a stream cipher here, they're going to take the initialization vector and put it before the key. Same key, right? Same key K used to authenticate and all that. But uh, that's okay, because now we have a different key that we're using to encrypt each packet. Even though you get to see, you know, sort of, you know, how it differs, but you don't know what the keys are because you don't know K. You're the attacker true. So in principle, it's a very good approach. Um, the problem is, um, we'll see. Okay, there's an issue, uh, actually a cryptanalytic attack because of the particular way they use this initialization vector, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so here's the idea for uh, the actual encryption. So each packet, again, each packet as it's sent, um, Alice is going to generate an initialization vector and just tell Bob, you know, here's the initialization vector I used. Bob knows the key, so he can create this key that consists of the ID. He knows the key K, so he can create this key, plug it into RC4, do that initialization part, and now actually start encrypting the bits, as we did with RC4. So they can each generate the same key stream. They're not reusing the key, right? The actual key that's used to encrypt is different each time. Good. Except. Except it's wet, so it can't be too good. Okay, so they made some, uh, there's some problems here. Okay, the initialization vector they use is 24 bits, three bytes, okay? You know, RC4 is all based on bytes, right? So the initialization vector is three bytes, the first three bytes. Okay, now, if you think about the IDs we've seen in other cases, so when we use, say, CBC mode, how big is the ID? How big is the initialization vector? It's the size of a block, so it depends on your cipher, but the <laughs> smallest block size, the block cipher we looked at was 64 bits, right? So it's at least 64 bits. 24 bits is really small, okay? It's a problem that you have a small initialization, uh, a small ID here. Well, think about this. If you're Trudy, you get to see the ID, right? The long-term key, K, never changes. So what does that mean? If you see two packets come by that have the same ID, what do you know? They were the same key stream. They were encrypted with the same key. So the key stream that was used to encrypt those two guys was the same. Well, is that ever going to happen? Are you ever going to see packets with the same initialization vector? Well, yeah, unfortunately, because it's only 24 bits. Okay, so you have a couple of choices here. Uh, you could generate your initialization vectors at random. That's you know, usually the standard advice. Or you could generate them in sequence. Okay, generate them one after another and just cycle through all two to the 24 possibilities. Well, let's suppose we do that. We generate them in sequence. Now, let's just put some numbers in here. Let's suppose our packets are 1,500 bytes. The link is 11 megabits <coughs> per, per second. Uh, and just plug the numbers in as you go through the 2 to the 24. You have to wait till it cycles all the way around, if you're Trudy, until you see a repeated initialization vector. How long does that take? It takes about five hours. Okay, that's a while. You have to sit here and collect the packets or, you know, go have, go have dinner and come back and collect some more packets. But eventually you're going to see a repeated initialization vector. And then you can start trying to do attacks, you know, like you do on one-time pads, all right, to recover uh, the key string. And 
wait five more hours, you're going to see another one, and another one, and another one. Okay, so you can collect a lot of these. All right. On the other hand, if you generate the initialization vectors at random, how long do you have to wait? How many IVs would we expect to have to see before we find a repeat? Two to the what? Two to the twelve. Two to the twelve. How do you know that? By the birthday problem. Okay, it's sort of just like a collision, right? How, how long do you have to wait? So two to the twelve. So put two to the twelve in here and you get seconds. <laughs> Okay, so in a few seconds you would see a repeat and then you'd start to see more and more after that. Okay, it would become easier and easier to find. So uh, the point is, Trudy knows when the IV is reused, right? Because you get to see that. Every time the IV repeats, you know that it's encrypted with the same key stream. Okay, so you can start thinking about cryptanalytic attacks there. Uh, okay, another thing, okay, Trudy might be able to do is to insert traffic, okay? So if she could insert, suppose Trudy can insert some traffic and she sees the, she always gets to see the ciphertext, right? So the point of that is she would know the plain text, okay? She knows the plain text that was encrypted, she gets to see the corresponding ciphertext. Okay, does that help Trudy? Well, it's a stream cipher. So what happens when you XOR the, the plain text and the ciphertext together? You get the key stream, okay? But that key stream is not just any key stream. It's the key stream that corresponds to the particular ID, right? Because it's you see that as well. Okay, now you got that. You got that key stream. You wait a while, and eventually, another packet shows up with the same ID. You can decrypt it because you have the key stream. <laughs> okay, and if you can do this enough times, you could sort of build a dictionary, right? We have a bunch of different IVs. Every time you see one on your list, you just immediately decrypt that particular packet without ever recovering any key. You don't know anything about the key itself, but you actually recover enough information about the key stream to really do some serious damage. Okay, so the question is, is it really practical? Could Trudy ever hope to uh, sort of see that matched plain text and ciphertext. Should, could she ever insert traffic into the system? Well, okay, here's what I'm thinking of. So, um, she, here, here's an example, okay? So, suppose Trudy sends uh, an email to Alice and says, could you forward this email to Bob? And Alice is using the wireless link, okay? So Alice sends it to her wireless access point. It's encrypted. Trudy knows the plain text, Trudy knows the cipher text, she recovers it. So, so as a practical matter, it's really plausible that you could uh, know some of the plain text, right? It's really, not, it's really not reasonable to expect that you, Trudy would not know the plain text uh, in some cases. Okay. Um, okay, so... Yeah, okay, so we've got this... Uh, so I'm just going to mention this cryptanalytic attack. It's actually in the book, if you want to look. It's in Chapter 6, and it's not that complicated. It just comes down to looking very carefully at the initialization process that's used in RC4. Okay, and as of most attacks, this attack was uh, invented by... Shimmer. Shimmer. Yeah, actually, one of his students invented this attack. And it's kind of, the story behind this is kind of interesting. Uh, Shamir's student came up with this attack. Shamir and his student developed this attack and published it, you know. And, you know, it's like an academic paper. Uh, you know, like most academic papers, people yawned, you know, and they saw this. I mean, people realized, okay, web's broken, okay. Uh, all the sort of security researchers and people like that took note, okay, web is uh, broken because there's this uh, very practical, you know, devastating cryptanalytic attack that required essentially no work. Okay, about six months later, there was a group, um, I think in Georgia or somewhere, they took this cryptanalytic attack, which Shamir had developed, and uh, they implemented it. And they actually decrypted web track, which everybody knew would work, right? It was obvious it would work, but they actually did it. That was like on CNN, front page news, you know, <laughs> they had actually broken web. So there's something to be said for actually implementing an attack. Okay, okay so anyway. So uh, the initialization vector, as we've said, is prepended to the key, and that's the, that's the web key that's used to encrypt a particular packet. It's three bytes that go on the front. Okay, now how does the uh, key work in RC4? Well, it's all in terms of bytes, right? So that means, okay, if you look at what's going on here, 
the actual key that's used to encrypt a packet, if we break it down into its bytes, you know, however many bytes there are of the key, depends on the size of K, but however many bytes there are, we know the first three, okay, because that's the IB, all right? So if you look very carefully at the run-up process, the initialization process, and you happen to know, the technical requirement here is that you have to know the first byte of plain text um, of a message. In fact, for most, a lot of file formats, it's zero. <laughs> okay, so in a lot of cases, you know exactly, it's, you, know, you know what that first byte is, and it's not common. Usually you know. Okay, so usually all the criteria are met for this. And all you have to do to make this attack work is you just collect the data, okay? And if you look at the IV, and if the IV satisfies a certain condition, you can use it to help, help you determine what K3 is. So you sit here and you collect the data and you look at the IVs until you have enough of them that match the criteria, and then you just solve an equation. Basically just write down an equation and you know what K3 is. Okay, once you get K3, you do a similar thing to get K4, similar thing to get K5. So it's essentially no work at all. All you're really doing is just collecting data and recovering, uh, recovering the key. So it's a pretty bad, I mean, pretty devastating uh, attack here. And it doesn't really matter how big the key K is. You can recover it one byte at a time, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, get any harder. Okay. So the bottom line here, there are a lot of attacks, and a lot of them are very, very practical. You can download tools online will help you to attack web. Okay, you know, the, the, the stuff's out there. Uh, so you can recover keys uh, and break real traffic. And so what's the solution? What's the, what's the uh, best way to prevent attacks on web? Number one, don't use it. <laughs> Okay, but like most things, you know, uh, it's out there, and so, you know, uh, still, it, it's like anything. If it gets out there, uh, it's going to be around for a long time. Okay, so suppose you're stuck with what? What could you do? Is there anything you could do to make it somewhat more secure? And there are a few things. Uh, you can tell uh, the access point uh, to only accept packets with certain MAC addresses. So. You know, you can specify this MAC address is, is good. If it comes from another MAC address, don't accept it. Okay, is that a good idea? Well, how strong is that? It's easy to spoof MAC address. You can spoof a MAC address, okay? So, but at least somebody has to figure out what's a valid MAC address, you know? So they have to do a little bit of work. And there's an open web access point just down the street, so they're going to go there. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of your hope here. Another thing you can do is the ID of the access point. Uh, the so-called SSID is used by default as broadcast, it's just sent out, okay? If you don't know that, um, so you can set your access point to not broadcast that information. So if you don't know that, it sort of acts like a password. You have to know the name of the access point that you're trying to get access to ahead of time. Okay, how good is that? It's pretty easy to recover. Is it, is it the SSID on the clear? Well, you can tell it not to broadcast it, so it's not sent to. It's not sent out. It's, by you mean it's it not does. sitting here saying my name is whatever, right? My name is Bob. Okay, it's not broadcasting it out to the world. CS Club is there, but CS Club is there, right? Java. But, well, I mean that like when you when people are connecting to a wireless point, they're sending the SID on like unencrypted. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so the point is. When somebody actually connects, if you happen to be listening then, they will tell you what the access point is called. And there are actually tools that will force them to disconnect and re-authenticate. So it's not that hard to get the access point. Okay. 